Kenya is a constitutional democracy and any issues that the opposition have to settle shall be addressed in a constitutional and legal manner. Where the words of Mushemiwa Daktari William Ruto, who is the President of the Republic of Kenya. Of course, these words were backed up by the tough speaking Deputy President Mushemiwa Rigathi Gashagwa, who said that the only discussion that they'll have with the Right Honorable Raila Molo Dinga is his exit permanently from Kenya's politics. We don't know if the Sunday negotiations that happened that led to Raila Odinga calling off the strike were about his permanent exit from Kenya's politics. Well, we shall evaluate that much more. But we know that the, the Azimio La Moja insists that their demands are still on the table, demands around the audit of uh, the servers, demands around uh, the cost of living and precisely the price of Onga must come down to 100 Kenya shillings, but also issues around uh, constitutional reforms of the IEBC, among others, continue to be demands on the table. That shall form phase one of our conversation. Phase two is that we know that uh, the anti-corruption court here, sitting here in Kampala, did last week remand the Honorable Minister of Karamoja, that is uh, Honorable Kitutu, to Luzira, of course, on issues and uh, allegations around corruption and misuse of public funds and public goods and resources. Ugandans don't seem to be satisfied. They are baying for more blood and saying that, you know, how about the other ministers who are also mentioned in the same saga? Where does that leave the aspect of justice for Karamoja? So that is part two. We shall look at Karamoja, an in-depth analysis, but also the emerging issues therein. Viewers, to put all this into perspective, is a panel of uh, immaculate young people that it's now my pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon. And in no particular order, the Vice President of Uganda National Students Association, Her Excellency Mutesi Adija, is a panelist today. Adija, thanks for sparing the time to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. How do you feel? How is Unsa? I feel okay. Unsa, uh, yeah, still also struggling with corruption things, but <laughs> all will be well with time. Yeah, uh, we are we are putting in our prayers and. Uh, the other panelist on the show is Benjamin Emor. Benjamin is a student of law at Macquarie University. He joins us for the first time, Benjamin Karibusana. Thank you very much and greetings to the viewers. Yeah, how do you feel? How is Macquarie? Uh, Macquarie is uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, <laughs> we know it is interesting. Yes, ne uh, next to myself is Council. Sarah Naguja, a fresh uh, graduate from the Law Development Center here in Kampala or here in Uganda. Council, thank you for spending the time to be here. You are welcome, Mr. Chibaga, and I'm impressed to be on this show for the very first time. Yeah, we are very happy to have you as well. Thank you. The last panelist on the show is uh, Mr. Waiswa Augustine, who is uh, the debate president at Mountains of the Moon University, all the way from Fort Porter District, city rather. The tourism city. Yeah, the tourism city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must emphasize that. Yeah, 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 yeah it's a very important. Karibu Ndugu. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much, and I'm um, so much uh, pleasure to be here again. Yeah. We are very happy to have you. Uh, Benjamin, let yeah. me just uh, begin with you right away. And, you know, the question at hand is that, first and foremost, is the Azmio Laomoja camp legitimate in their demonstrations? Are the demonstrations legitimate? Or were they legitimate? Or were they capitalizing on an economic crisis to score political points? Um, all right. Uh, so, very interesting question. Um, there are always two sides to the coin. Yeah. Um, they could be capitalizing on the economic situation. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that uh, the recently concluded elections were extremely close. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. the camp has been alleging that, uh, according to a dossier, I mm -hmm. believe that they, they attained that um, from a whistleblower, mm -hmm. that you know they believe they won the election. Um, so, if you ask me whether these protests are economically motivated or based on anything economic, um, you know, on the face of it, I would tell you no. Um, I don't believe that they are economically motivated. Um, but let's look at some of the um, allegations they're making or some of the 
uh, the, the basis for their protests. Um, they are claiming or they claim that you know, the cost of uh, living has been high. And uh, I don't disagree with that. Um, it has increased uh, significantly. However, um, it should be um, noted or um, people should have this at the back of their mind that this is a government that has just recently been elected. And um, the Kenyan, the previous Kenyan government was in no way um, an economic um, strong, uh, strong uh, you know, giant or was in no way making a huge um, progress uh, with, uh, with the economy. So when they say that they are protesting the rise in uh, prices, and I could be wrong, someone is correct, I um, don't think it's something that has happened overnight. It has had to be gradual. Um, so that's one. Secondly, um, the other basis for the protests has been the, um, the, the IMF loan mm. um, that the condition for Kenya to be able to accept uh, the loan from the IMF was that they stop um, providing subsidies. And so this has been um, one of the points that uh, you know, the Azimio camp has used to, um, to send people to the streets. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, uh, it is no, um, you know, no one is proud of uh, a government that makes concessions to, to you, know, you know, an international body such as the, the, the IMF that we know has been um, strong arming governments uh, into making all sorts of decisions and and um, you know adjustments in order for them to be given aid. Mm. Um, in any case, um, no one uh, would like to have uh, a government that is strongly reliant on on foreign aid because mm. of the conditions attached to it. However, um, in reality, um, I believe if a government um, in its planning. Um, in its economic planning and uh, its vision for the country sees a need to accept loans in order to finance some of their projects, then surely they, um, they would be obliged to. Um, they have to be cautious in regard to um, some of the recommendations that may come along with that, some of the um, ties that may come along with that. Um, but there's no denying that we need aid. Mm. Um, countries need aid especially African countries, African economies um, need aid to function. But that's an economics debate and we shall come back to that. Mm. Um, Are there political undertones in yes, all these demonstrations? Yeah. So, uh, as I said earlier, this has been, um, this has emanated from a you know, very tight election. Yeah. And um, a very interesting one because it saw the, you know, uh, President Uhuru uh, finally leave power. Mm. And uh, we have in a new player, not really new in the sense of, uh, you know, totally uh, not new in, 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 in Kenyan politics, mm. but uh, in terms of the presidency, a new president. And so some are led to believe that there had been negotiations, as we saw from uh, the aftermath of the 2017 elections mm. um, that led to the Building Bridges Initiative um, campaign by mm. the government, um, that there had been negotiations between President Uhuru and President, uh, sorry, and, uh, and uh, uh, Senior uh, Raila Odinga. Um, see, uh, Mr. Odinga is a huge political figure in Kenya. That's um, right. Yeah. He has been in Kenyan politics from the 70s. Um, he has <clears throat> run five times and uh, he has, uh, well, I don't want to say he has won in some, but he has managed to be part of a coalition government. He has managed to negotiate for a coalition government, um, I think in 2007. He almost successfully did it in 2021 with the uh, Building Bridges Initiative. Um, are there political undertones to the protests? I personally believe so. Um, and, for uh, the and, reasons. and that's why I want to shift yes. a, a bit and, and, and bring in Hadija. Hadija, the political undertones that uh, a more uh, was just about to uh, to delve into is that indeed we all agree that the election between Kenya Kwanza and uh, Azimiola Muja was a highly contested election. It left the country polarized. All right. So you look at then what you would have expected from, for example, uh, William Ruto and his team, or even Raila Odinga. 
I think what we saw, um, and, and re regrettably, the statements of the deputy president, for example, when he said that, you know, the only discussion with Raila Odinga is his exit permanently from Kenya's politics. You know, I, I mean, you cannot wish him away. This is someone who scored almost 50% of the country's votes, all right? Shouldn't there have been uh, the deep pocket theory that he who wields power should, you know, extend the audit much and say, my brother, please, we love Kenya more than we love ourselves. Come on, we talk about these issues. But instead of chest pumping and saying, oh, no, I'm the one in charge, and then, you know, even the other camp is saying, okay, now we shall show you. So, politically speaking, shouldn't there have been, shouldn't there have been a much more, uh, I don't know how to call it, subtle diplomacy post that kind of election? Uh, thank you so much uh, for this question. When you, we all observed the Ken, how Kenyan politics went, and literally both parties have supporters, and there are many supporters. Massive supporters, yeah. Massive yeah. supporters. And whatever we are seeing in Kenya is mass, massive destruction. Like, since every party is having a bigger population, they believe that if they push for an agenda, they have a good number of people to back, them, yeah. to back them up. And in this, they are using the youth to fulfill their agendas. But I believe, and if Raila Odinga can give Ruto time to organize the government, because um, Kenyan government, to be organized, it takes time. I think it can take a maximum of 18 months. Mm. But the government hasn't <laughs> even spent eight months in in the government and all this economic crisis is coming uh the result from election everyone is not satisfied uh, i believe if the system is given a chance at least to first organize and see how they can go about the economic crisis and also negotiations are uh, at this moment these guys served together i think in 2022 20, 27, 20, even making the constitution of Kenya, they are together. I 2010. Mean, yeah, yeah, 2010, 2010 they are together. 20, 13, yeah, yeah, so I believe if they come as one, because this economic crisis is not affecting a, a certain political party or a certain group, I think they should put all their differences aside and come together, have discussion, uh, discussion crisis. Uh, 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 they can be like, yeah, you defeated me. I believe uh, so. This time calls for patriotic leadership. Yeah, yeah where someone sacrifices their personal interest and then um, puts forward the country's goodwill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we, we, we have our differences as the presidents or me and you. But let us put that aside. Let us revise means on how we can stabilize uh, uh, the the Kenyan economy and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I hear you, and I don't know who should have reached out first, but I think that the deep pocket theory, to me, still applies here, because the Kenya Kwanzaa is the government in power. They have all the leverage and the tools of state to say, right or dinga. We, yes, we agree, we had a highly contested election, but be it as it may, Kenya must move forward. Mm -hmm. so, 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 but I think the fear is that perhaps... Uh, the Raila demands could be more like what he talked about, the BBI, a handshake, you know, him having been part of the government. And, and, and perhaps that's what Kenya Kwanzaa is trying to avoid. Uh, we are seeing, uh, if we have all observed what is taking place in Kenya, it's two things. Raila Odinga wants the government to be changed. Mm. If it's not to be changed, power sharing. Mm. That's what we are observing mm -hmm. in Kenya. And these demonstrations are putting Ruto in a dilemma to decide on what to do. If he acts, he will be accountable of anything that will come along with his decision. Mm. If he doesn't act, it will show that he is incapable and then thereafter he is not meant to be the president because he has no authority. Mm. At this time when Raila Odinga can stand and call for a public holiday, it shows that uh, maybe President Ruto is incompetent or he's not powerful enough mm. to guide the country. Mm. So at this time, I call upon mm. uh, maybe people of Kenya mm. to reflect, to reflect, 
to sacrifice. This is the time of sacrifice. This is the time to show your patriotic spirit. Mm. How much do you love your country? Admit this. Your so. Um, uh, a, a simple question. Mm. If Raila Odinga today becomes the president, will the price of will the commodity price mm -hmm. there and then reduce? Good question. We, we, will all this, whatever you're talking about, is the cause of this demonstration and strike? Will everything change in a blink of an eye? You need time to organize. Yeah. Mm. So I, I think Roto should be given time. Yeah. Fair enough. And. Uh... Augustine, I, I want to bring you right in. And, uh, and the, the aspect of, uh, how should I put it? Uh, you look at the way the election went, for example, is that, uh, like we have all acknowledged on this platform, is that mm. the election deserved some sort of consensus building post the election. But uh, what we saw were instead just thumbs, you know, I mean, one can't believe that they are much more powerful than the other. But if you're to look at the nitty gritties, the underlying tones that are not said in the public, is that, for example, uh, Raila Odinga's company used to be the sole producer of gas cylinders in Kenya. Post-2022, that monopoly has been opened up, all right? Two is that um, you look at uh, Brookside uh, Milk Company that is owned by the Kenyatta family. They have been monopolizing the dairy industry for a long period of time. Post-2022, that sector is being opened up. Uganda's milk is now being accepted more in Kenya. Mm. And you know that leaders are also inspired by, like she said, personal interests. Interest. So my question is, do you think that there are certain personal interests that are being uh, a championed vis-a-vis -vis national interests? That is one. Two is that Martin Jr. Luther King, someone who organized one of the most successful civil rights movements in the 1960s, said that for a legitimate protest or demonstration to stand, it must meet four tests. One is that you must have a genuine grievance. Mm. Two is that you must have engaged the government in power, at least through all means, through petitions or through... I mean, you must show that you've tried to engage them yeah. and have failed to respond. The third is there must be an, an aspect of 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 uh, of justice and uh, the fourth i don't recall but do you think Raila Odinga meets that test is the second question well uh borrowing from what my brother actually said right from the start that uh every queen has two sides we cannot forego the fact that as a person as Leila Odinga must be also championing his own agenda as a person. Someone is right to think and to develop a thinking that uh, he's using the protest as a wake-up call to share the masses or to share the, 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 the netizens that are actually am around. Because uh, just like how she said, we are just from a very, very heated presidential polls. And when you look at the margins, these two people actually have a very small difference that separated them. Separated Around them. 2,080 votes. What does this communicate? It yeah. communicates power from the two wings. Yeah. So why am I calling it a wake-up call is uh, economic prices or economic cost or these are prices that are raising, it is a global issue. It's not only affecting Kenya, it's not only affecting uh, a certain section of maybe a tribe or something, but it is a global issue that started way back, actually, during the start of the Ukraine war. That's when even uh, Uganda, we faced ourselves with uh, issues to do with uh, raising commodity prices and all that and all that. But my biggest question that I normally pose is, uh, why is it that right away from the start, during the time of the war, Leiro Dinga is just coming up right now to protest for the raising uh, commodity prices. Is it the right time anyway? You know, what you're going to do at a certain situation will be determined by how the magnitude of implementation, the timing, is the time right for you to come out right now and you're questioning the government over economic prices and all that. He did make, she, 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 she has just uh, told you that actually this is a, a global issue mm. that needs 
or maybe not to just come up one day and you're like, I'm striking over this. Mm. Mm. If Ruto went into the steering of being the president, rather Odinga, mm. taking up the seat of the president to, to, to take on Kenya, could he there and then provide a solution? Why am I even bringing this? You can see that at the end of it all, we saw him, the person that came up and is like, we want this, we want this, with a lot of demands, out of just a meeting, a diplomatic meeting with uh, the president, the current president Ruto, we saw things getting back to normal and then the people are like, really, is that fair enough? Because mm. if you came up with a genuine reason and you're fighting for something that is really fundamental and you're eyeing to yield it, then how come in just a blink of an eye you shift the guns and you're like, I think the storm is over? That communicates what I talked in uh, at, at, at the start, that you're going to find that inside him, or maybe had this kind of, let me use this as a call to the masses and to the whoever is holding powers right now, that I'm also strong enough, that is the personal interest that you're talking about, before even looking at the national agenda and providing, or maybe the interest of the masses, that mm. is the whole idea. Yeah. Mm. Well, and to me, interesting, so, because you see, Raila Odinga, in the second term of the Jubilee government, was very close to uh, Mwishemiwa Uhuru Kenyatta. And I think he did contribute that if Kenya found itself where it found itself in 2022, eco economically, Raila Odinga somehow played a role because at some point he was prime minister, then at some point, you know, he was working very well. Even when BBI was uh, declared unconstitutional, I mean, they had a very close working rapport with uh, Jubilee government. So, so somehow he has played a role to finding Kenya where it is today. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we could look at that later. But I want to bring in uh, Sarah. Sarah, uh, the demands being put out by by uh, Raila and his team, of course, uh, Kalonzo and the rest, is that, you know, open these servers. We want to see what is in these servers. But if you recall, during the presidential uh, petition, uh, the, the, the Martha Kome led the Supreme Court said that you know court was sent on a fishing expedition mm -hmm. that the servers were in fact opened and but they failed to find something substantive that could have affected uh, the, the 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 outcome of the election so the question is that where does all this demand leave the supreme court uh, decision and as as a lawyer i mean you should tell us because court is i mean <laughs> When people have uh, disagreements, court is the is the arbiter. Yeah. yeah so, sorry, the arbitrator rather. Mm. So does this undermine Kenya's judicial system? Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, 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 to address this very well, we shall. I, I will start by looking at the, the the demand of having to look into the servers yeah. by by Ray Laudinga. And um, I'll start by saying that in his own view and the people that were actually supporting him, this was justifiable. Because if the, um, uh, if the, the ruling uh, Ruto and, and his team and everyone, if they really um, thought that the election process was proper and the audits were, you know, mm. authentic and everything was well, they ought to have let it free for everyone to, to, to go and revisit and, you know, do the forensic and everything. Now, relating it to the uh, decision of the Supreme Court at last, um, I would want to say that uh, it somehow are undermined the, the, the Supreme Court and the judiciary at large. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, and you answer in affirmative, and, and perhaps I agree with you, but then because what Raila is putting out are his personal opinions mm. and court cannot uh, be run on personal opinions yeah, the court is run by virtue of the law mm. there is a constitution there is uh, a presidential elections act there are all these laws in place so if a politician x has his own opinions i i think court should not be moved by that court lies its sorry relies its decisions on aspects of the law aspects of proof aspects of evidence and facts. So, yes, yes. I, I, contrary, I, I, I don't think that uh, the jurisprudence of Kenya will perhaps be undermined because a politician, A, thinks that, you know, the issue of servers wasn't addressed 
uh, 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 critically by the Supreme Court. But also, is that, I don't know, because, <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, Oremo, is it called? Orengo, rather. Orengo, who was uh, Raila Odinga's lead uh, counsel, is actually the governor of, uh, of uh, Kiasa County. So I, I don't know a lawyer who cannot abide by a Supreme Court decision. <laughs> Or he is simply playing politics, and he has thrown the law out of the out of the window. And then at, at that point, um, he will have played with the law and have thrown it out of the window mm. and side with the political sentiments mm. and interests. All right, thank you, Benjamin. The people of Kenya remember very well what happened to them post two thousand and seven. That particular incident led to the 2013 International Criminal Court uh, proceedings that I think you're privy to. And names like uh, William Ruto, names like Uhuru Kenyatta, Arab Sang, among others, were mentioned in that indictment. Some people think that the ICC hammer still hangs above uh, uh, the people of Kenya. And that is why even when Raila Odinga could have had so much grievances. The, the Sunday night where they had the chance to sit, perhaps they, perhaps they did reflect that we could end up back again in ICC. So the country needs to move forward, but also we cannot afford to go back to the same sort of prosecution process. So let's evaluate just for a bit the aspect of the ICC uh, ruling and decision and where that places uh, violence in Kenya. That is one. Two is that you know that Kenya has a Public Holidays Act of, 20, uh, uh, of 2015, I'm not sure, whereby it is only the Cabinet Secretary who has the mandate to declare a public holiday. Now, here is an individual by the names of Raila Odinga declaring 20th March a public holiday. What should have been the legal implications of that kind of action? Because I think that his actions should have legal repercussions. So... Is, is this selective application of the law in Kenya? All right. Um, thank you very much, Jadega. So firstly, you raise a very common controversy, which is uh, the enforcement of international law. Yeah. Um, the, the, the nature of um, international law is distinct from any other law in that um, it's largely based on its acceptance, on whether it's binding. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, you can, it, it's, it's not, it, it's based on how uh, it's accepted, whether two parties or parties to a certain agreement, to a certain law, accept that that law exists, accept that this custom exists. Yeah. Um, so that's the nature, the nature of uh, international law. Uh, firstly, there is no law, uh, unfortunately, that can curb... Um, the situations as we have seen them unfold over the years in Kenya, mm. because Kenya, Kenya's legal framework is brilliant. Um, uh, you know, the, the, there is no amount of um, law, and that goes for Uganda's case as well. Mm. And we are going to discuss um, um, corruption in Uganda uh, that can effectively deal with a political situation as it is in Kenya it largely falls on political will. And the same applies to international law and the ICC ruling. Mm. Um, when you look at, for example, the politics that's being played um, in the Security Council in regards to Russia and Ukraine, mm. um, it's not a question of um, you know, a lack of uh, you know, a, a lapse in, in the law or you know, a lacuna in the law or you know, that the law is weak and not able. It is simply political will. Mm. Um, it falls to the parties that hold the most power in most cases, um, China, Russia, US, mm. to be able to sit on a table and agree on a way forward. And I think the same applies to Kenya's politics. Um, Raila Odinga is 78 years old, I think. Um, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's people, as you said at the, at the beginning, you know, asking that maybe he should, you know, consider, you know, stepping aside from, and I don't think it's a, um, you know, it's a bad request because he has played his part in Kenya's politics, as you said. 
he has built Kenya um, for a long period of time. He has been he has participated, um, you know, at, you know, right from the beginning of multi-party uh, politics um, and, and 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 before then as well. So the question um, of whether um, the law can effectively deal with, or whether the law and you know the ICC rulings can effectively deal with, and you mentioned the, the Chief Justice Kumi and her, her team, mm. and their decision effectively deals with the political situation a certain nature, to a certain degree of such a nature, to a certain degree, yes, mm. but it largely falls on, on uh, political will. So, so, um, so, just, so, just so, so what we have is a political uh, situation political that situation requires and... a political response, not yes. a legal response. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they sort of work hand in hand. But mm. I, I was about to give you an example of the compromises that have been made mm. over the years in Kenya, right from 2007. Um, and there's a, there's a backdrop to the protests, uh, the, the violence in Kenya. Mm. Um, they, there's been, um, before 2007, I think 1991, um, there was a tribal conflict um, mm. between the Kikuyu uh, and the Luas and Kalenjin. So mm. there's also um, largely, you know, a tribal um, backdrop to the, to, to the violence as well. Um, but they work hand in hand, uh, but it largely falls down to political will. I'll mm. give an example. In 2007, um, when uh, it was largely, uh, you know, stated by international observers that actually both parties had, you know, uh, substantially uh, rigged and there had been a, a substantial evidence of rigging um, in, in those elections, they came together and formed a coalition government. Um, recently, after the 2017 election, President Uhuru sat down with uh, Raila and the, um, the situation, um, let me say, subsided from, from, from then. It's going to happen again with, uh, with um, uh, President Ruto and Odinga. Um, there's only one constant in, in, in all of these, and that is, uh, that is uh, Mr. Raila Odinga. Mm. Um, his role um, now in politics uh, seems to be bigger than any political party. It seems to be bigger than any economic situation. Um, he holds such weight that he's able to call for a public holiday, as you said. And of course, um, he, there is a legal provision for... Um, you know, for when and how public holidays uh, should be held. Uh, but you're not going to, you know, maybe pick a stick and, you know, um, enforce, enforce the law in, in, in that way that you're going to say, no, 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 uh, Raila is not the law. Do not listen to him mm. uh, because um, of the, the weight that he holds in Kenyan politics. So it comes down so, to what so, they so agree. So meaning it is some sort of animal farm. Uh, I mean, uh, we are all equal, but uh, some are more equal right. than us. Some are more equal than us. And it's, it's something that, and that is the beginning of, uh, <clears throat> of mature politics, I believe. Uh, to, dis to, to, to agree that, look, uh, Odinga is actually a big figure. And um, in as much as his interests may not align with um, ours, or in, in as much as his interests may not align with the nation's interests, because mm. I think he's a largely personal, by the way. Mm. Um, because you cannot convince me that after running five times, and um, you know, failing to to uh, to win in, in any of those. Yes, you may claim that you have um, uh, you have been uh, cheated, mm. um, but you cannot convince me that your persistence um, is still largely based on on the fact that you want to contribute. You can contribute in other arenas as a senior political yeah. leader. Yeah. Right. So mm. I, I I don't think um, I think it will f it falls between a balance. Uh, there, there has to be a balance between political. And, and a political um, sort of negotiation and the, and the legal framework. And the legal Thank framework. you. Amazing. Yeah. Hadija, mm -hmm. let's just compare Kenya with other contemporary countries in the region and perhaps Uganda. You look at uh, the way the Kenya police service handled the demonstrations. There was some bit of restraint mm -hmm. that allowed Kenyans to actually, uh, you know, get to the street and, you know, Air out their concerns. The violence was extremely restrained. And this came at the backdrop of massive Kenyans pouring on the streets. Over the weekend, we saw Macquarie University students just holding a press conference. Just a press conference. They are not demonstrating. They're just sitting and saying, hey guys, we have concerns. And the way they were handled by 
uh, police. The police brutality was not called for. Now, I don't know where is the difference between the Kenya uh, police and, and the Uganda police. That is one. Two is, could you speak to the aspect of the civic competence of Kenyans? That, I don't know, they seem to be more conscious of their rights. They seem to know that, you know, we have a right to uh, demonstrations, we have a right to uh, express ourselves, you know, we have all these rights and we shall exercise them. I think here in Uganda, the case might not be exactly the same. So just those two things, the security aspect and the civic competence of the people of Kenya vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Uganda. Thank you so much uh, for the first question about how the law works in Kenya and how the law works in Uganda. Mm. We, though we are neighbors, but we operate differently. Mm. And this brings us to democracy. If, if you're studying democracy, uh, democracy is not a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, well, the system, uh, how a country becomes to be democratic, you start from authoritarian, then mm -hmm. transition, then uh, maybe maturity, and mm. you can persist in mm. an economic shock. But Uganda is nowhere in that. Mm. Uh, but if you study democracy, you can see at least Kenya is in the transitional stage. Mm. Uh, uh, Kenya is in a transitional stage. At this point, uh, Kenya, uh, a country to be at least in that transitional stage, people know their rights. Mm. Uh, elections, that's why... Kenyan election, we are all over the world. Everyone was talking about it because mm. they follow the law, they follow protocol. Mm. But now I'm surprised at the end when someone lost, they they failed like to harmonize. Yeah, that shows it's beyond the law now. It's between personal interest and experience versus, mm. versus the versus the office. Mm. Yeah, so uh, people in Kenya uh, know their rights. Uh, the country is more democratic compared to Uganda, and for Makere, uh, I know. And it's... and you no know, surprise me because the Kenya 2010 Constitution mm. is actually uh, a reflection mm. of our 1995 Constitution. Mm. So they adopted our legal framework, but I don't know where the difference is. Uh, the thing is, in Uganda, uh, our president has overstayed in power. The first step the country to be democratic, mm. there is a change of regimes, change yeah. of governments, and mm. we have observed that in Kenya it has happened with different parties. Mm. So every party comes with different agenda to develop a country. Mm. But in Uganda, we are, we are constant, like we are in one position, <coughs> there is no government that has come to Actually, show us what someone, they have. Someone one time said that Uganda presidents have bombed their way into power. Mm. <laughs> you come and you bomb the other group, and then you end up in there, so bomb you. Uh, so yeah. I, I, I agree, we haven't seen a peaceful transition of power from one leader to another. Yeah, here mm. in Uganda, it hasn't happened. Yeah. And maybe if it happens, we will see. That's why we in Uganda, we can't face what is taking place in Kenya. At this moment, Ruto is in dilemma. If he does something, he'll be accountable. If he doesn't do anything, he will be incompetent and is not capable to lead the people. So in Uganda, the fact that we have one president, mm. we are not facing that. And when it comes to Makere, um, for which it was, it is worse in Makere because mm. uh, students we have really been oppressed. Uh, some of us, uh, I can't say that we embraced that, mm. but when you put your degree at risk uh, in, 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 uh, in a view that you, uh, you're advocating for students' rights and what, at the end of the day, if they suspend you, you've okay. gone alone, mm. and your parents have been paying for your school fees, no one will contribute <coughs> and the people you've been fighting for. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, so is there some sort of gagging, gagging the civic space? Because... I mean, I read that the student who attempted to commit suicide because he was suspended. Mm. Uh, for a student who attempted to commit suicide, that was a government student. Mm. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm a government student. Um, I'm, I'm studying on government. Mm. Uh, but you find a challenge. Uh, most government students who are given scholarships come from a poor background. Mm. Yeah. So you reach at campus. Your hope is on the your, your survival is based on the government allowance. 
But at this time, if the vice chancellor can send a letter and be like, maybe you put the semester at halt and you come back next year, or you wait for us to to give you allowance, but the money is not yet there. And you're, you're hearing all this saga of corruption, Karamojayan sheets and what, men are being splashed in different, but the student is starving, dying at Makere. Yeah, so if the government feel like can't keep the consistency, in providing for students, mm. they better reduce the number or put other measures. But if the students is that Makere knowing that I'm on government, the government should be there to provide in the right time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and, and and about the demonstration, uh, Makere politics, I think uh, it's now a culture. Uh, some parties, remember we reviewed the constitution, Mm. And uh, we abolished all the political party involvement in the election. Uh, we are the 88th, I've been in the 88th. And are you proud of that? <coughs> no, I'm not proud. Are you proud that you abolished political parties, you abolished demonstrations, all those things? Yet, no, 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 no. yet those are rights enshrined yeah. in our constitution. Yeah, Chidega, I'm not proud. Article 29 mm. provides for freedom of association, that I'm free to belong to any mm. political entity. I'm, I'm, I have that freedom and right. The law is there, but mm. implementation. Uh, personally, I've been in the 88th government, um, and I've witnessed political parties have been uh, are still there. So a political party is not something you're going to hold at the yes. gate, you this there, or to arrest. You get mm. there are systems that will be hard to be removed from such a university. Mm. But even in this 89th election, good presidents. Some are still standing and mm. aspiring. They have parties behind. Just but to bring us, just to bring us uh, back, back into context is that the comparison here was that the security apparatus mm. and how they approach demonstrations and dissenting opinions. Mm. So could what is the difference between Uganda's police force vis-a-vis -vis Kenya's police force? Mm. Where does the difference come from that one is so brutal? Then the other is just you know like so calm and restrained. Like, why is there a difference? Um, for 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 Kenyan politics mm. and and the, and the military thing as they handle their things, uh, I believe they are more democratic in Kenya. Mm. That, that that's the thing I started doing. Okay. If you're democrat, you know you're going to be accountable of anything. Yeah. And at this time, the situation that Ruto is in. Mm. It's not a time of making, adding salt in, uh, in the wound, mm. you get. Ruto has to be extremely careful. Yeah. So I think even his army have been guided on how to not, handle that people. Not his army, okay, it is the, the, it Kenyan, is, it the, is the, the national, the national, the national army. army yeah. have been guided on how to handle the civilians, the yeah. protests and what, because mm. a lot is going on, All which right. is uh, a different case in Uganda. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to bring in uh, Augustine. And I get your point. It is hinged on democracy. Yeah, that democracy. if you have a democratic uh, uh, society and environment, even the players uh, mm -hmm. know that you know they are accountable to the people, yeah. and you cannot just uh, you know order uh, police to you know arrest and do all these things. But Augustine, mm -hmm. she mentioned the aspect of democracy, and I want us to capitalize on that with you. And the aspect here is that Kenya's democracy has been nurtured, but I want us to evaluate the role of civil society. And under this, you know that uh, uh, part of the institutions that played a strong role in the demand for multi-party uh, dispensation in Kenya was the, Uganda, uh, was the Kenya Law Society, mm -hmm. which you could see as a civil society uh, you yeah. know, entity. But today, as we speak, the churches are very vocal in Kenya. Actually, they've been at the forefront of saying, okay, why can't you open the servers? And let's see. So, the churches in Kenya have continuously played a very big role towards nurturing Kenya's democracy, towards holding leaders accountable. So, civil society in Kenya, vis-a-vis -vis civil society in other contemporary uh, countries, what is it about their civil society that is not here? Well, it's uh, so good that both of us have uh, the civil societies. Mm. And uh, the major thing here is how much you respect the systems. It's also a key point. Because even when you talk about uh, having democracy in a country, but when you're not respecting the systems, like you're not giving the people that freedom mm. of actually doing what they are supposed to do right, it means 
you're infringing on them. Yeah. What do we see in Uganda is that on paper, we can have uh, very <coughs> the civic uh, organizations and civic societies and all that. But uh, their work is always uh, stopped because the, maybe the regime or the system wants them to operate in a given manner. And how now, the, those who try to operate in a, a given manner or the system that the government all wishes, you can't find that at the end of it all will totally go off their guidelines or principles on what they are supposed to, to, to offer. So the whole thing now comes to how much are you giving uh, these uh, civil societies the freedom to do what they are supposed to do? If we are having uh, maybe organizations that are protecting human rights, like uh, the other time, uh, I remember I was it headed by, I'm forgetting the name, Chapter 4, something mm -hmm. like that. You remember uh, Chapter Opio. Opio, Opio, yes, Council Opio. Opio. Yeah. Remember the fracas that happened to Council Opio because of uh, talking so much and protecting people's rights and all that. He was almost being prosecuted. That's what I'm talking about, that we can have the system, we can have the, the societies available. But how are you giving them that legacy, uh, the freedom, to do what they are supposed to do. As long as you're not uh, allowing these societies to do what they are supposed to do in uh, a corrective manner, you're influencing them, you're penetrating into their activity, you're closing some of them, trust me, mm. things are not going to go in uh, a similar direction. Mm. There will always be that kind of questions from the public, like, hey, these people, are they also working for the government instead? Mm. What, what? Because there is even uh, this presumption of uh, the societies themselves saying, what if we play uh, opposite what the government wants and we get closed? So that question causes fear in them. And at the end of it all, you're going to find that themselves, instead of focusing on what they are supposed to do, they are focusing on how can we now correlate with the government mm. to do what they feel should be done by us. Mm. They completely lose that track. So they are now uh, sort of boxed into the aspect of survival. Mm -hmm. rather than trying to, you know, do what they set out to do. Yes. I hear you. So, <clears throat> as we take a short commercial break, I want to conclude with you. And that is the aspect of uh, the silence of uh, Mwishemiwa Uhuru Kenyatta. In all this fracas, he has not come out publicly to either make a comment or, I mean, to say anything about it. Perhaps that is the right thing to do. I don't know. You'll tell us. But also, is... You look at the argument around dynasties in Kenya. Mm. And then you look at the notion that the Kenya Kwanzaa campaign was run on. The hustlers. Mm. You know, that like it's time for the hustlers. We are coming to, <laughs> to, to topple the dynasties who have been there for such a long and massive period of time. Mm. Is there a paradigm shift in Kenya's politics? Are the hustlers actually beginning to take charge of their country or the dynasties stand tall. All right, thank you mm. so much. Now I'll start um, by addressing the issue of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta's silence. Mm. And um, I think it is justifiable because he does not want to associate himself with either of the of the parties. Mm. Uh, he's, he, he, he's not willing to associate with the Ruto, he's not willing to associate with um, with um, Mr. Railo Dingo. Even when doing the campaigns, he openly supported yes, Railo Dingo. Yes, he openly supported Railo Dinga, but remember Railo Dinga himself has a history in mm. that country, mm. being a very vibrant political figure and um, political uh, body in the country. Mm. He has had his history um, when he stood with, um, what is his name? I think it was Mwai Kibaki. No, 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 no. no. Mwaki Bak. Yes, 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 yes. In yes, 2007, yes. 2007, 2007, yes. Yes. Mwaki Bak. Yes. Maybe yeah. he's reflecting on something ahead. Mm. Because you remember after that 2007-2008 election, mm. um, again Raila Odinga rose and mm. said he was not willing to accept what had come out of the elections and something yeah. like that. And they went to, and I think they demonstrated yeah. around that time mm. until when um, this UN Secretary General came in and Kofi sat, Anand. Them, Kofi Anand, yeah. sat them down and, you know, so they, they went into a power sharing agreement. Mm. And there was a certain act, I think, Accords and um, mm. Reconciliation Act of 2008 yeah. that actually ushered in the 
prime the, minister's the coalition position, government, and he yeah. was the prime minister at the time. So I think um, Uhuru Kenyatta is intending to pull back and, and stay silent at the whole event mm. because at the, behind his mind he could be having that maybe Ray Laudinga is having something big that he's building for himself as a person mm. or maybe with his supporters. And at that point, mm. he would rightly choose to keep a distance and mm. maybe look at the whole set of events take mm. course. Lastly, mm. does the emergence of uh, William Ruto offer a big threat to the dynasties? Mm, we, we, I cannot rightly... Okay, dynasties in quotes. I, of okay. course, dynasties is... I, I don't use it in a very formal in, sense, in but I mean in quotes, sense. yeah. Yes, and now... Um, I think uh, Ruto was inaugurated in um, on 23rd September 2020, right? Yeah. So he has not made um, a year. Not yet, yeah. Not yet a year. Yeah. He will be making a year in, in September this year. I don't want to really um, outweigh or in a way on the, the dynasties, as you said in quotes, mm. and the what? And the hustlers. And the hustlers. Like us, like me. <laughs> <laughs> like us all. I think the hustlers should still have some hope. Mm. They should still have some hope. Yeah. yeah. It's it's too premature to, you know, mm. conclude that maybe they're getting bad or getting mm. there. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Council. That brings us towards a short commercial break. To the viewers, thank you for making a date with us this afternoon. And just don't move your muscle because we have much more coming for you after this short commercial break. See you. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access. A right to identity. A right to anonymity. A right to be forgotten. And a right for protection of minors, among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Uh, we'll be back from that uh, short commercial break. We are glad that you're still with us and following the Youth Roundtable. Well, let's just summarize Kenya in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. And let's begin by evaluating the role of the East African community. And perhaps we, we would have expected that at this point in time, the chairperson of the EAC, which is I think currently a uh, Mushimiwa Evariste Indashime of, uh, of Burundi, who is chairing the, the community. Well, perhaps we would have imagined that, you know, uh, uh, even before Raila and, 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 and maybe and, uh, Ruto meet up on Sunday evening to discuss these issues, perhaps uh, Mushimiwa Evariste should have come out to say, okay, brothers, this is not right, let us, how can we, you know, address this issue? So, I don't know. Is the EAC a, an institution of form or it has some substance attached to it? Um, all right, so I think it would only be fair mm. um, for the EAC, uh, firstly, to allow any sort of reconciliation. Between internally. The two yes, internally. Oh. And then um, go ahead to intervene. Um, because we've seen the, the currently under ceasefire, mm. um, um, pending uh, negotiation. Mm. Uh, there's a truce. There's a truce. <laughs> there's a truce for now, which always seems to happen. Yeah. Um, so, so to answer your question um, about the ESC, again, I'll go back to the point of uh, of political will. Mm. So we have we have form. We have um, you know, uh, for example, let's imagine. Uh, uh, Mr. Everiste decides to uh, pay a visit to the two and um, 
uh, chair talks or um, you know, try to mediate and reach a, a resolution or conclusion. Um, it's only at the end of the day down to the two uh, leaders um, um, to decide on what what next and what steps they take. Yeah. Um, so I, I I want to strongly emphasize the point of uh, political will. Political will. Because it has uh, for years, not only in African politics um, but across the world, frustrated a lot of things. Mm. So you have uh, two groups of people. Um, one representing the state, one representing um, the opposition. Um, is the opposition really concerned with, um, you know, putting uh, the, the the government in power to task, or is there some other agenda that they are pursuing? Mm. Um, is the state uh, interested to listen to what the opposition has to say, or they are, um, you know, they they will persist with their own perception of and, and, and ways of doing things. So it comes down to political will. And uh, for me, at the level that uh, Mr. Odinga has reached now, uh, he should be the driving force. He should be the senior leader. Um, he should be the, you know, the, the person that um, the Kenyan politicians look to. Should rise above the occasion. Yes, should rise above the occasion, should rise above the rest and, uh, you know, and come to some sort of argument. Um, you mentioned dynasties just before the break. Mm. Uh, dynasties in courts, by yeah. the way. Um, and so President Ruto presents, um, you know, a deviation from, no, not a deviation, but he presents a hope that, uh, you know, this uh, thing of dynasties has come to an end. Not that it's wrong in, um, in any sense, uh, but um, he presents um, a new style, a freshness. He brings about a freshness to to Kenyan politics. Um, however, it's important to note that he has been a part of um, the government before. And so it's a question of, is he really different? Or it's a certain, um, you know, he's capitalizing on political indignation and, uh, you know, uh, capitalizing on it to, to, to his advantage rather than really uh, being uh, pressed on it. Uh, we'll see. And, but largely, and, mm. it comes down to political will. And just a follow-up on that, is the winner take over the political system? You know, is this political system haunting many African democracies, that the winner takes it all? I mean, there is no sort of uh, uh, avenue for either power sharing that, okay, that with all the votes that you've gathered, you're left with nothing. I mean, I have 50% of the country's support. Shouldn't there sort of be... Um, something away from the winner take all that yes you've come second and maybe you will be you'll hold this office so speak to the winner take all system which is actually it cuts across I think many African democracies mm -hmm. or African states and how they govern it's a winner take all political system so is it about time we begin to rethink that kind of system um, yes and no uh, so I'd like to use the illustration um, of the United States uh, which we believe to be the, um, you know, the, the the most democratic, you know, the best democracy in the world, as as they always assert. Who? Um, no. The the United States. Ah, no, no. <laughs> of course, of course not. But uh, that's that's what they always uh, want to to assert. Their posture. Yes, their posture. <laughs> um. So, but um, in terms of election violence and uh, you know. The, the the level of indignation in, in their the levels of indignation in their um, elections, it's only until recently with uh, President Donald Trump that there has been you know this you know anger this um, you know recklessness this uh, viciousness um, amongst the people during protests, and so bringing that back to to uh, this uh, winner takes all system, it can work. If there's a certain level of um, class about um, uh, amongst the the, the 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 parties to this system, um, if President Odinga and President Trump were the type to concede and say, "Look, we may have been cheated, we may have not won, um, but I'm ready to concede and move forward," mm -hmm. um, this would all be the past. Yeah, and. Uh, Mostly in Africa, because it, it seems to be a temperament across the board. So from mm. you know national, parliamentary, local government, everyone that loses an election 
um, is never satisfied. Mm. Whether um, you know there's been evidence, uh, blatant evidence of of, of of rigging or not. Um, mm. I'm not saying that if you've been rigged, you should just uh, you know concede and say ah, it's okay. No, you should mm. pursue the legal forum and, mm. and, 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 and and see what you get there. Yeah. Um, but it comes down to to the temperament of the leaders. Yeah. Um, so again, since uh, for as long as I've remembered, I can't remember an election that went down uh, the way the the Trump Biden election. So perhaps is it time down. for us to maybe review and say that okay, away from the winner take all system, can we have something else that yes, because I basically you've come second and you don't just go to your backyard in uh, in uh, Kigezi and you see it, but you have a position in government because you command a very significant following. So is it about time we really think? No. I, uh, I think so. Mm. But again, what would the alternative be? Because that would then, um, that would then uh, give you know, justification to political greed, okay. I would say. So for example... But also I think it would, blurred, it, it would blurry the lines of accountability because if someone who is supposed to be checking you is then holding a is position. Compromising. No, but, but maybe the, the position could be leader of opposition. I, I don't know, but I don't know, just... It's, 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 it's a tricky one. It's mm. a tricky one um, because the system was imposed on us. Yeah. Um, and we had our own ways on, of dealing with things. But um, I, I think, I still think there is hope. We have with a thought. I think it, mm. uh, it largely falls to... Um, the, the, the will of the leaders. The decorum, yes. Uh, Hadija, mm, I see you have comments, I, I don't know, regarding the EAC, I'm not sure. Oh. But uh, as you as you comment, is that what is happening is that uh, the issue is being raised by uh, Azimiola of Moja Camp, Raila Odinga and the team, have been referred to Parliament and the Senate to handle. Now, who is the leader of the Senate? Who is the leader of Parliament? The leader of parliament or the National Assembly of Kenya is Right Honorable Moses Petangula. This was someone who was seen as a blue-eyed boy to William Ruto. I mean, he is a strong supporter of the Kenya Kwanzaa. Who is the speaker of the Senate is uh, Amazon King. Amazon King is still a strong uh, uh, supporter and stalwart of Kenya Kwanzaa. So do you think that the grievances of um, the Azimula Moja camp will find justice in a parliament that is dominated, chaired, and led by Kenya Kwanza? But also your comments regarding, I think, the EAC? Uh, yeah, so starting with EAC. Mm. Um, you know, in every organization, mm. we have the main actors. Mm. And... This takes us to the UN. When you see actors in the UN, mm. and we are now facing the crisis of Ukraine and and Russia, and, and, Russia, and you're seeing the veto powers are the one involved. So you find difficulties to use the the the, the, the what the constitution or the the the. the the UN, the, Council the UN Charter. Security Council Charter, mm. to put those people in uh, in account. Mm. So it's the same thing that applies to EAC. You find Kenya is uh, is a is a big is a, is a big actor in the organization, mm. and now you're calling uh, Burundi, you're calling you're calling uh, Uganda to come and account. Mm account Kenya, you know what I mean. Yeah. So seriously, uh, this goes beyond the EA, the EAC, mm. the, okay, but, the okay. charter and Okay, even if you are to put aside maybe and I okay, even if you are to say that Burundi maybe is not as, as big as, as Kenya's economy, uh Dar es Salaam competes with Nairobi in terms of, you know, their their economic prowess. So, is it the economic imbalance, in fact, uh, neutralize it? Because there are other powerful economies in the region. So Kenya cannot say that because they are a big economy, then no one should, I mean, no one can, uh, you know, check them. No, if, if you look at other countries in the, in the region, uh, they also have sides. 
you get. Mm. If you see Uganda, we are divided. We have the government, we have opposition. You might find opposition in Uganda is backing up a certain president in Kenya. Mm. You find out the government in Uganda is backing up a certain government in Kenya. So there is a lot to 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 analyze before involving gays. But now I think this issue in Kenya, in, in, in Kenya can be resolved on the personal negotiation, discussion, or petition. Yeah, but what I would advise to use this full means before calling up the masses to 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 drive your interests if you want to pursue something as a leader, mm. you're involving innocent people who don't know the reason as to why you're pushing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um going back to the question of Yeah, will the grievances or the issues being raised by uh Azmiola Moja mm. find justice where they've been deferred to, they've been deferred to Parliament and to the Senate mm. that is dominated, chaired and led by Kina Kwanza. Uh, uh, in the in the first in the first round when, when I was speaking, I talked about uh the the writer Odinga to give time to Ruto to organize the government. I think this also calls for the constitutional review and also appointing. Uh, there, there is a, the, the statement that the vice president said that the people who will be appointed are the people who supported the president and what. Yeah. So I think that is not a right statement to make because you make other people feel like maybe they're not part of the government. You make them think that maybe they should actually join Raila Odinga to see that their interests are being achieved. Yeah, I think uh, the the president and the prime minister at this point, mm -hmm. the government should have one voice. And there is a reason as to why powerful people in office are scripted. So that's to avoid the error. Like to be very careful on the choice of the words you're using in addressing the public. Because mm -hmm. not everyone will take uh, what you have said in, uh, in, in the way that you meant it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they should be careful in choosing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see the Kenyan... Uh, economy, around 46% uh, of the revenue go to salary, what is left for the country to develop. So I, I think it's high time for the constitution to be reviewed, to reduce on the number of people who are in the government position and mm. see how they can come together and discuss economic crisis, mm. uh, leaving alone the multi-party problem. Kenya, the poverty is affecting everyone in Kenya, regardless of the party. Mm. the crisis of the commodities increasing every day so it's time for Ruto to put aside his personal in uh, for Raila Odinga to put aside his personal interest and mm. bring back the patriotic leadership sacrifice and he will be remembered to to have served the country and mm. to have sacrificed he will be remembered yeah. rather than jeering the demonstration what yeah. Yeah, since he knows that he has a background of Kenyatta. Actually, mm. I think Kenyatta should also uh, resist himself from whatever is going mm -hmm. on. Because yeah. I think it's giving Raila the backup and confidence to see that he can really maybe mm. achieve something, either overthrow Ruto or share the government, which is hard to share the government. It's mm. really hard. Yeah, Yeah, because I can't be competing with you and then we win, I win, and then mm. I appoint you in a bigger position. It's really hard. Mm. I'm not safe. Mm. Yeah, Ruto, he's not safe the moment he appoints Raila to be next to Anytime you can wake up in the Adidas, morning and things are... Uh, I'm just speaking like, like a typical <laughs> politician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, 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 but Augustine, uh, if you recall what uh, Deputy President Mwishimi Warigati Gashagwa said some time back, is that Kenya had lost two billion shillings as an effect of the first demonstration that happened on 20th of March. Mm. Kenya is strategically located in this region. It has access to the sea or to the ocean. So many of these diplomatic missions have their headquarters in Nairobi. So the region stands to benefit either directly or indirectly from the peace and stability and the emancipation and economic development of Kenya, somehow we benefit from the spills, you know. So let's evaluate the economic implications 
of any impasse that could happen in Kenya? How does it affect the region? How does it affect trade? Because you know that our 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 oil, our our, our petrol mm. comes through Mombasa, mm. right? So I don't know the economic implications of all this. Of course, it communicates a lot of hurdles to do with uh, the economy, the economics of uh, the, the, the the countries that are sharing the block. Because uh, just like how you mentioned, Kenya is not standing firmly just independent of the other countries we are sharing borders you're talking about the oil that is passing there of recent i was seeing uh, our milk goes to kenya so it means that any political unrest that occurs in any of the neighboring countries it communicates a huge a huge uh, also loss to countries like uganda because it means if those people are not well we cannot import them that poses a question of to this local farmer that is producing the milk, uh, the farm, where will it go? If our oil is passing there and it is uh, one of the things that we are now looking at as a tool to gear us to the middle income status, it means it also has a pending or a question to our agenda as a nation in uh, as far as yielding the economic uh, prosperity is concerned. So anything that happens in Kenya, not only in Kenya, by the way, Anything that happens in any neighboring country and spills over to us here, it causes a great, great, great impact because uh, at the end of it all, we are not surviving alone. We are surviving, we are marketing together. That's why you see that uh, <clears throat> it is one of the main event pillars uh, in as far as uh, East African integration is concerned, to have these uh, regional markets, to have uh, common currencies, what, what. So it speaks a lot of... Uh, economic setbacks in as far as whenever the country or let it be Kenya, let it be DRC, let it be any other nation, as long as we are together and we are calling ourselves the East African bloc, it means anything that happens the other side, it has a lot of uh, repercussions to yeah. us here. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and I agree with you, Augustine, because, you know, um, with all this interconnection mm. that, that, that the world find it, finds itself in, and uh, authors have, have actually said that we are moving towards a borderless globe, that mm. we shall be so interconnected. Yeah. And by virtue of so many things, by virtue of trade, by virtue of our technology, mm. by virtue of our times, uh, the, 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 the common security agenda, you know, that, that you might find yourselves trying to work towards. So mm. eventually the need for interdependence and the need for interconnection is uh, ever becoming uh, more more yeah. more pertinent. So yes. I I agree with you. Mm. Uh, Sarah, let's just uh, put this conversation to bed uh, once and for all and move towards Kalamoja. And the question is, uh, Kenya in the region is seen as a mushrooming democracy. At least they have attained some level of political maturity. So when such things begin to happen, where does it place? other aspiring democracies in the region. You look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the practice of not accepting electoral outcomes, the practice of undermining the decisions of court, the practice of uh, 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 abusing the law because of, you know, what he said that, you know, you think you're bigger than the country. So where does that leave democracy in the region? Okay, thank you. And um, I want us all to agree that Kenya has had and uh, has enjoyed um, maximum freedom since their independence in 1963. And um, they've had, uh, their democracy has been growing gradually over time. Um, and as compared to other democracies in the regions, say Uganda, Tanzania, mm. and Burundi and Rwanda, as, as we, we all fall into the East African community. Excuse me. It is true that uh, their democracy is growing, but as we start eyeing the practices of undermining court, um, court uh, decisions, uh, as we see practices of um, demonstrations and other related um, behaviors that all come due to the fact that people are no longer trusting the system too well. Uh, this puts their democracy at risk, I must confess. Mm. 
And um, at one point, if they are not so careful with the way they are handling their stuff and politics and economics and everything, they'll soon fall suit like other democracies, like my own Uganda, yeah. where um, uh, there is high abuse of human rights and um, mm. and uh, and um, because we have looked at the way people are abusing court decisions the other side, but even here we have seen it where people are granted bail today and after two minutes like this, they're getting them back to the pickups and taking them to prisons and whatever. Mm. So I want to think that um, if if all this continues and they, they do not arrest their issues fast enough, they risk their democracy being abused like it is in other states. Because we have to, conf uh, to, to admit that as we, we are now, the, the East African community as we are, at least Kenya is ahead of us when it comes to the democracy. Mm -hmm. That's why last time we were seeing that the police in Kenya, as they were running around the rioters, now these people started stoning at the police officers. And the police officers were instead running out, ru running away from the, mm -hmm. from from the, the rioters, mm -hmm. you know. And, and if it were Uganda, the police officers could not have run away. They ought to have shooted or even do something worse, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So really, if they do not curb their issues at a faster stage and with, with due urgency, they risk having their democracy fail. Yeah. And I agree. Let's just put this to bed because, I mean, Kenya has demonstrated and, you know, inevitably so because their democracy is growing mm -hmm. and their economy is growing even faster. Mm -hmm. You look at Nairobi, I think in 10 years, Nairobi will be a destination city in Africa. It is, it is growing so fast and their democracy is also growing and, you know, they are a leader in the region and we wish them well because through their good leadership then we can benefit as a region True. but bingo let's move let's shift gears and move to karamoja and uh benjamin a region that in my view has suffered double jeopardy from the colonial days to an extent where we had leaders saying that we shall not wait for karamoja to develop you know <laughs> during the colonial days they suffered tremendous injustice you recall there was a contestation whether Karamoja belongs to Uganda or to Kenya during the demarcation by the colonial masters. You remember uh, the locus classicus or landmark decisions like Expatem at all, whereby those who disagreed or who had political dissent with the colonial regime or even with the post-colonial regime were deported in Karamoja, the likes of Abu Mayanja. So you can see that historically, there have been a very marginalized uh, region in this country. Now, someone would have thought that as a leader, as a minister, you're cognizant of the Karamoja history. And therefore, should there be some sort of relief and assistance going to Karamoja, the least you can do is to mismanage it. I don't know, what's your own opinion about what's happening in um, Karamoja? It's said that we have to to sit here and, you know, rather debating, you know, policies that have been put forward by ministers and, and, and debating, you know, other serious issues. Um, we are backtracked when we have to debate about uh, or debate on issues such as the stealing of iron chips. Um, it is regrettable. It mm -hmm. is upholding. It is... Um, uh, it speaks to the nature of uh, um, of governance in this country. Um, it is extremely. Um, it has it has been eaten up largely by corruption, uh, but Karamoja, <clears throat> for as the historical context that you've provided, um, was a region that was neglected uh, for so many reasons, um, because of the hostility there by the the by the peoples and then of course the NRM government came into power um, and then you know they had to de-arm first before they could um, you know get down to any instituting uh, any policies in, in, in the region um, but I'll say two things one with the way the Iron Sheet scandal has unfolded it speaks to a certain uh, casual manner in which 
uh, certain dealings are made um, mm. in, in that office specifically, in the office of the Prime Minister. So it is more than meets the eye? It is, it is more than meets the eye because, mm. you know, it, it, looks, it looks funny to us. It, it, okay, not funny, but it looks you know, stealing iron sheets. Mm. Like, who would think about that? But it's, it's the sort of thing that gives you the impression that um, someone was in a room and said, hey, look, there's some iron sheets that have come through. Let's divide and share, mm. you know? And it's, it's that, it's, for, for us, it looks like such a big thing that would not even, um, you know, no one in their right mind would consider it. But it speaks to a, a certain casual manner um, um, and in, in the way that, you know, corruption happens in, in, in our government. Um, so it, 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 it is a very big issue. Uh, so how do we deal with it? Yeah. Uh, legally, I mean, how many legal bodies? Um, do we have uh, that, are that have the mandate to deal with corruption? Could you um, just mention the corruption them um, unit, uh, the IGG, the police, um, um, and the uh, council will help me mention DPP. others. The DPP, DPP yeah. you know, there are so many bodies uh, that have the mandate to deal with corruption. Mm. Uh, so why, what's happening? Mm. Well, where, where is the gap? Is, is there a gap in the law? No. Um, the, the law um, has tried to, to deal with all possible um, you know, lacunas in, in that area. So where does the issue lie? Mm. Um, is it, so we have ruled out that it's not the legal framework. We mm. have ruled out that, uh, no, so where, where is the real issue? It comes down to political will. Mm. It comes down to um, the, the, the type of leaders we have. Um, so you have, in essence, an, let me, let me try and balance between the context of Karamoja and the general context of corruption in the country. Uh, so you have a region that has been neglected. Um, you have a region that lacks a certain awareness about its, its um, uh, you know, you could say their, their, their rights and, 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 and their, uh, you know, what they're entitled to as a people. Mm. And that is not exactly their fault. Um, I would say one, it would be down to the government, mm. but the people themselves, the few people that have come out of Karamoja, the elites mm. um, within the country, um, to take it upon themselves to try their level best to emancipate their people. Mm. Um, because to a certain degree, I personally believe that um, there is a certain um, pushback from, from, the, from the people of Karamoja in, in, in relation to to certain um, modern ideas. Um, but that said, mm. we have a situation where the government has consistently, for a long time now, failed to deal with uh, corruption. Uh, we have had scandals such as this, such as the, the Gavi scandal, I think in 2000, yeah. the Gavi fund scandal in 2008. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the manner in which it is dealt with largely rests on uh, the will of uh, those at the top. Mm. So, you know, a certain negotiation or a certain um, discussion that those at the top have that, hey, you know what? Um, let's put in these three and let's leave out these two. Mm. Let us, um, let him go and uh, let the rest stay. Mm. Let us put Honorable Kitutu and, uh, you know, let, let us leave the rest. The rest will learn from, from, from. So there's, there's a political will. Mm. Um, the system has been so eaten up that I think uh, the president, with all his goodwill and 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 and, and knowledge, um, has uh, has reached a level whereby he has failed completely to, to, corruption. to get on top of this problem. Um, it, it it has eaten us to a mm. level uh, whereby um, we we are now discussing the stealing of iron sheets. In, in, that, in that's how that's how low that's how low it has born. gotten. And I, I agree with you. It's extremely and very absurd and. I don't know, but anyway, we shall uh, uh, discuss way forward uh, later. <sighs> Hadija, you are an emerging female leader. I want to draw to your attention the names that have been mentioned in this Karamoja scandal. Is the vice president? Well, I mean, I, I think Article 28 of the Constitution, I mean, uh, the presumption of innocence. Well, we assume they're innocent now until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. But even the mere fact that they're being mentioned is bad enough for me. So you look at names like the vice president, who is a female, the speaker of parliament, who is a female, 
the prime minister who is a female, the, the Karamoja minister who is a female, the deputy Nandutu, uh, uh, a female. So it is, I don't know, and I am not being prejudicial. Mm. I, I speak this without any prejudice, don't get me wrong. But is this an indictment on women leadership? Because I had imagined that, you know, women are naturally more tender, more caring, your mothers. And no, you see what was happening in Karamoja, all those images. You'd imagine that as a mother, you'd feel that sort of pain. Oh, this could be my son or my daughter. Mm. And I don't know, you'd perhaps handle things much more better. Does this somehow cast a doubt on women in office? And I'm not being prejudicial at all. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really saddened about what is happening and the fact that we are here discussing iron sheets of all of things that are going. Mm. Like we could be discussing other things, but the fact that we have reached this stage it shows that the corruption in Uganda has reached its maximum. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, sure. in my personal view. I think the affirmative... Just like Matua said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in my personal view, I think the affirmative, affirmative action oppositions have really been abused. Mm. Uh, that, that's what I can say. Because uh, you see people who have been given these offices, um, they have been misusing them. Mm. And the fact that women some are just appointed. Mm. There is no competency. So I think we should go beyond affirmative action and look for competency. Even if a woman is going to be given a certain position, are you fit for that position? That's, I think that's where we should move. Yeah, and we, if we see Honorable, Honorable Goretti being pinned on everything, just know she has been sacrificed I know she has been involved, but believe she, me... She was the lead distributor. Yeah, she was. Mm. But you can't tell me that she was alone. Working alone. Yeah. Mm. Just know there are, are men behind her. And they have... Because women, uh, you can't stand there and defend and do what. There are men who are there who mm. have, can't be touched on. And mm. they, have just, they are like, you just go, cover us up. So I think if this issue is going to go on, they should investigate everyone. And I should call upon her to also tell the truth. Mm. Tell the people because they ask her, she'll be like, I don't know, forgive me. What? <laughs> who are the people who are involved? Mm. She keeps quiet. Mm. So there is a gun on her. You might think that she doesn't want to say them, but there is a lot. There is a lot and she'll be like, you know, if I say beyond this, I might be in danger of my family. You know, those people, they are most times threatened. Eh? Mm. They, they have something to lose. Eh? Mm. They have family, they are parents. They, maybe if this is over, she has no any other opportunity to work anywhere. So men are behind. You can't say that it's women who are being pinned or misused. First of all, maybe they put women who are not competent for those positions mm. so that they manipulate them. Mm. Competent women mm. are being left out. Okay. And most women have laid in office because they know how they maybe they are they are tracks on how they embezzle, how they do what. Young people who are competent, who can really stand, they are being left out. Yeah. So if a woman is in that office, make sure because I give my personal opinion. I've been in my career politics for my year one. Uh, I'm, I'm now the UNSA vice president. But in 87th and 88th, I've never held any ministry position in my career. Mm. Why? Because those positions, you can be used. Mm. You can be compromised. You're in a position. The position is not yours. There is someone behind you. So I call upon ladies to stop being used, mm. just own something small, but out of your sweat. Mm. But the fact that you are appointed, someone just calls you, come run for this position, they support you in your campaign and what, anything that you're doing, you'll be the, you'll be the face, yet you're not the beneficiary of whatever has happened. Yeah, so I call upon women to fight and do what they're supposed to do in their own capacity, not to be used by other people. 
Yeah, and uh, thank you, Adija, because so what we can take from that is that, and what we can agree over is that the mismanagement of the issues of Karamoja mm -hmm. should not at any one point be seen as an indictment on women generally, but rather just pocket cases who perhaps are mismanaged at an individual level. Yes. All right, yes. I think fair enough. I want to move on to uh, Augustine. Uh, Augustine, I know you have comments regarding uh, what she has said, but also I want to bring to your attention the aspect of the moral decadence mm. of leaders in Uganda. <coughs> I have read Matthew Lukachire's book, 70 Years a Witness. Mm. He narrates the way he resigned after he was, um, after parliament was paying for his blood regarding the mismanagement of the privatization of Uganda Commercial Bank. By then he was minister in charge of privatization in Uganda. Mm. And the mere fact that there was an allegation, he said no. I will resign. I owe Ugandans a bigger responsibility that I should have supervised this process. And the mere fact that I did not do my role and perform my duty, I don't deserve to hold this office in trust and confidence of Ugandans. Now, those are the leaders we had back then. I mean, mention them, the uh, James Wapakabulos, the, uh, the Mugisha Muntus, who were in the house by then. Yeah. You know, you talk of the likes of... Um, uh, Agri Award. I mean, that, that kind of generation of leaders, you compare them with the ones of today, whereby some are censured and they say, I will not leave office. You've been censured by parliament and you say, I will just not leave office. But some of them, the allegations are just overwhelming. The facts are glaring, but they still insist on holding public office. I don't know, speak to the moral, to the moral decadence of our leaders, but also your comments regarding Hadija's. <clears throat> yeah, starting with uh, the comments that, uh, or maybe, are we having uh, women that are incompetent in these positions? I think my answer can be yes and no. But uh, before even we dive into so much of understanding, are they competent enough for what? Let's look at uh, the method or the tool that they use to put these women in these positions. How are they getting chased into these positions? You're going to find that uh, right now in Uganda, we are used to a system of uh, work for me, do this for, for me, then I will pay you something in return. And this is what exactly we are seeing almost in every position here in Uganda. You're going to find that someone is given a position just on grounds that or maybe he provided an aid at some particular moment. So you're going to face yourself with a scenario where immediately this person gets into office, instead of focusing so much on providing what it, the position entails, this person will focus on satisfying the boss. Yeah. This is vividly everywhere. You can mention all the names of the women that are taking up leadership positions in here, but uh, out of how many names you mention, you're going to find that actually some of them are very competent for those positions, but because of what the brother spoke Could about. Could you just comment about competence? Because doctor, uh, I mean, Great H2 is a doctor. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So, I, I mean, what kind of incompetence is there? I, I, I'm, I'm, declining, I'm, I'm declining the, the aspect of being incompetent, really, but uh, it's just that they are dancing to the tunes of the people mm -hmm. that vetted them into those positions. So, at the end of it all, they will not work towards achieving what the region needs, like how you brought it uh, in the context that uh, Karamoja is a very delicate place, which actually every person would wish that if I'm put there, perhaps I can elevate these people from the situation where they are to some good level. But what happens is that whoever goes in position looks at how much can I score from this government? How much can I score from my position? So that in the case tomorrow I'm checked, and then maybe they have thrown me out of their position and all that. I've gone with something. That is the moral decadence you're speaking about, that we have shifted the mind from doing what is right. These people, you mentioned them, the Honare Bawali, the Gishamontu, what, what. You're mentioning them, and I feel like, wow, <laughs> how I wish one day they can say Augustine resigned mm -hmm. because of, you know, mm -hmm. presumption of doing what is absolute right is something that is automatically lacking in most leaders of Uganda. People are doing what makes them happy and what makes their bosses happy other than actually doing 
what the situation calls for. That's why you're going to come up with issues like, are they competent enough? Are these people really competent? Are, are we missing out something? Did we make an error in our maybe choosing and all that? But it goes back to how the system is protecting and leaving these people to play their roles as in independent as possible. Mm. Mm. <sighs> You guys are coming up with so many conspiracy <laughs> theories here, and, and I, I, I don't know which way to go, but um, Sarah, yes. the Honorable Minister was asked to speak under oath. Mm. She, she declined. Yes. We know that telling a lie under oath is an offence, perjury, an offense, yes. Yeah? Yes. which is in fact can be, um, <coughs> uh, you could be indicted for that. Mm. Mm. Right. So I don't know. I, I does does someone refusing to speak under oath? Is it an admission? Is it an implied admission of guilt? Because otherwise, why wouldn't you speak under oath if you know that you're going to speak the truth? Mm. So her de declination to speak under oath mm. does it cast some level of doubt on what on on the truth truthfulness? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chidega. Yes, um, um, a minister, Mary Kitutu. Is she prima facie guilty? <laughs> she is. <laughs> she is. No, we shall hold that Article 28 aligned in innocence. our minds. Yes, mm. the presumption of innocence yes, is still yeah. running fresh in our heads and it mm. must always run. Yeah. You know, until when they are prosecuted and all is done and, you know, beyond reasonable doubt that now, Mm. Ketutu mm. is, you know, guilty, guilty, guilty. for this. Yeah. Yes, but having declined it to speak on that, um, on oath, she reserves that right as a person. Mm. But to us, me, you, and the masses out to there, the general public, of course, it it builds um, a thinking within the general public that mm, this person is sober. This person now, like you said. Mm. Uh, this minister has a PhD, and we know that that is almost the highest yeah, level yeah. of education yeah. rank, you know. So she's too learned, she's too, you know, uh, she holds a special place um, among us women and the entire Uganda at large. Yeah. So I will not take it upon myself to say that it 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 shines some light of in of guilt yeah. within her, but. Um, she ought to have spoken on oath. That's if inside her, if she knew that, honestly speaking, I'm innocent on this, she ought to have said, but of course I'm saying that on, um, on, on what level? I mean, I'm, I'm saying that... Balance of probability. Uh, maybe. Yeah. You know? Now, um, her not speaking on oath, cannot guarantee that she's guilty for the offense. Mm. But, as I told you, that to the general public, it would have given her some relief from mm. the public and the general masses yeah. mm. that maybe, mm, you know, she has A spoken about trust. But deep inside her, Chitutu no, Minister Chitutu knows that the moment she speaks on oath and at the end of the day they find out that she's actually guilty, that is already another offense a criminal, of the sort. Yeah, criminal offense. Yes, it's a criminal offense. So really, I would pray and wish Good that we leave this to the prosecutors mm. to, to, to tell us which way to go. Yeah. Yes, because mm. at the end of that day, Article 28 mm. is still holding right. her like a baby until... Yeah. <laughs> then lastly is uh, Kedega. There is something uh, I want us to perhaps draw our attention to. Mm. We are talking about... Uh, Mm. This is a minister yes. that is working under supervision of someone called the Prime Minister. Yes. Is it right for someone to say she's being taken as a sacrificial lamb? Because why mm. am I bringing this? If a minister, every minister, we know that he works under the supervision of the Prime Minister, is it really realistic enough to say that she ultimately distributed these iron sheets without their consent? Good question. That is also something that we must drill our uh, attention to. Mm. You're going to find that, uh, yes, due to the virtue of the fact that she holds this position and she was the one that major person that was to do with the distribution of iron sheets, yes, mm. she did. But you're going to find that behind her action, there was a lot of big dogs 
in quotes that oh perhaps were commanding her do this do that do this mm. but now that just because now it has come in the light mm. and she has been put on the gunpoint the others are like carry on your cross and to hear from counsel counsel <laughs> what he is saying is there an element of vicarious liability and yeah. two is there an element of um what well, what's what's the word accomplice yes i mean by virtue of kitutu should they find her guilty don't don't the people who are supposed to supervise her become vicariously liable but also could they be accomplice to the offense um excellent so <clears throat> um there is an element of vicarious liability and um accompli accomplices depending on how uh, those prosecuting decide to to go about it um but I was, I was about to raise this um, um uh, when I was speaking earlier that um <laughs> there and I think uh the the different investigative bodies have come out to say they are still investigating the rest yeah. however the liability is best imputed um on honorable kitutu as the minister in charge of directly in charge of the and shit so it is much easier to prosecute and hold her accountable as investigations carry on because we have had a lot of uh defenses being raised uh, by you know by the honorable ministers mm. you know things like <coughs> the iron sheets were put in my compound and it, it is it so <laughs> and then that, what people. what becomes <laughs> easier to do is that the ability is uh, easier to impute um on on uh, honorable kitutu and then so prosecution becomes much easier mm. so it's easier to have half fast mm. as they try and build strong cases um um, um on vicarious liability in regard to the honorable the banja in regard to the rest mm. yeah so all right uh, as we as we conclude is my last question to you hadija is because if you look at some of these uh defenses being put out there is that we didn't know that these are iron sheets meant for karamoja or for teso because there are many affirmative action ministries under the opa so do you think that it's about time we reviewed or had maybe independent affirmative action um, ministries not not being under not being supervised by the <coughs> same ministry but rather independent so that we can avoid such confusion in the future yeah uh, thank you so much uh, I think what you're saying is true uh, we can have independent affirmative action because when these iron sheets were relieved when the money came in and they bought the iron sheets they put them under the office of the OPM <laughs> which was wrong in the first place because the office of the OPM had no right to, to keep those. So if, 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 if the OPM told them that I had iron sheets have arrived, it became a friendship affair. Eh? <laughs> I have, I have iron sheets. Eh, come the and other came. Some. My school does not have iron sheets. Eh? Okay, come and get this. So I, I, my, in my view, I think it's not, it's not right to have pinned uh, Minister Kitutu mm -hmm. first. Uh, if if you observe the how they handled Donald, Donald Trump in mm. US, they started from the roots. Mm. By the time they reached to the top, he had no any other excuse that I'm um, not. Mm. But the moment he started from the top, then these these ones who received five hundred, three hundred, they will find excuses and they they write their defense and what so. I think everyone should be investigated. Mm. If everyone is investigated, it will remove the fact that oh, most women are the ones involved in this. If everyone is investigated, we will learn who 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 is behind, who is the big dog behind. We will get to know their faces will be revealed. Because mm. this is the same scenario. If this Karamoja issue is not handled by everyone, like everyone to be investigated. It, it would act as an, a good example when it comes to the PDMW, ah, PDM, PDM, PDM program. Mm. Yeah, because if this is left like that, just no people are going to eat money in PDM. But if the president and the anti-corruption unit put their work all and they, they disclose everyone who's involved in this, a PDM program might prevail in the country and bring development yeah, because wow. people will be will be scared to be held accountable. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. Oh, our time is fast spent, so I'll call just in a minute for your parting shots. But also, as you do so, what do you think would uh, guarantee justice for Karamoja? So I'll begin with you. Your parting shots in a minute, but also what do you think would be justice for Karamoja? 
Oh, I'll start with the last one. To ensure justice for Karamoja, I think that the appointing uh, committees should do uh, first ensure that the people that they appoint <coughs> excuse me into these uh, offices are actually daughters and sons of the soil mm -hmm. maybe at some point they will feel for their judges their mothers and the like but because now um as we look at the minister kitutu she's from manafa i think that is east mm -hmm. yes I, I don't think she can feel for the people of Karamoja that but they, much. But they had Lokoris, who was a minister of Karamoja, and an MP from theirs. But anyway, I, I get you. <laughs> mm. Yes. And then the um, uh, prosecution of all the probable offenders would also act as nice. Justice. Yes. It would act as justice enough. Augustine, your last words and justice for Karamoja. For us to have justice, not only in Karamoja, but uh, as a nation, as mm. Uganda. One thing I must say when looking in this camera is that uh, Ugandans must stop, and I repeat it, must stop, looking at uh, these scenarios whenever we, they, they hold one office accountable, for instance now, Kitutu, you're going to see voices from wherever she's coming from, leave our girl, leave our girl. The moment we continue with this kind of talk, we are not going to only have officers that are corrupt, thinking that even if I do something, my people will be back me up, but we are totally going to lose the whole thing. Because uh, if we are having our systems, yes, Kalito trust in them, and they are acting something, but then we are pushing them with our voices of leave our girl, leave this and that, mm. we are totally going to lose the whole thing. So let the judicial system and everything take course. I just pray that Ugandans or whichever, we just step out of this mm -hmm. and we enjoy our money being accounted for. Thank All you. right. Yes. Mutisi, your last words on the show. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, Mr. Shidega, mm. initially, when the first lady was uh, Minister, Minister of Karamoja. of Karamoja, everything was moving smoothly. Actually, Karamoja, all the castle, cattle wrestling and what, he had, she had constructed dams, like everything. But the moment she was changed mm. to the Minister of Education, mm. uh, people who went there, they instantly started rooting everything that her, she had at least mm -hmm. built. Yeah, so uh, I encourage maybe the government to identify those cadres that have people's interests at heart. To see that if you're there, you're not, you're not involved in any corruption because Karamoja is already a damaged region. Eh? Mm. So anything you do is adding salt in the wound. So anyone, if, uh, the minister that they will allocate for Karamoja should have people's interest at heart. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, Benjamin, your last words. But just a comment regarding the insecurity in Karamoja. The UPDF uh, boasts about its Pan-African views towards uh, security. And it's in um, Somalia, it's in Congo exporting security, but it has failed to deal with cattle rustlers in Karamoja. So just, just, just a comment on that and your last words. Um, all right. Uh, let me just comment on that. Um, could it be working in their favor? Could there be a certain reason why when the government chooses to suppress protests, they will do it to maximum perfection? And uh, when it comes to a few guns here and there in Karamoja, they will struggle. I don't know, I could be wrong. The problem could be more complex than meets the eye. Really? It could be. Um, but maybe it works in their favor in a certain way. And, because um, the state has monopoly over violence. Yes, it does. So. It does. So it beats my understanding about you know, why we would boast. So if they, they have, um, their focus is on international policy, and, and that's where they want to... to to focus their manpower and uh, everything, then it's okay. Um, no. But just, 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 just on uh, on Karamoja and the ancient scandal, I think we should ask the important question. I think as these people are being investigated, we should ask ourselves um, the underlying causes um, of corruption. How do we deal with this problem? Uh, is this a symptom of an overstretched NRM government? Is this a symptom of a government in decline? Is this a symptom of a government that has overstayed in power and you know, it's time to, to, to uh, for regime change? Some may say that regime change may not bring 
um, any solution. Um, but we have not yet tested that theory. So we'll wait to see. Wow. Ndugu Zangu, uh, Asante Sana. Mm -hmm. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Ndugu Benjamin, uh, Ndugu Augustine, uh, my sister Hadija, and my sister Naguja for sparing the time to be here. We are really uh, grateful. Of course, to the technical team, Rashid and the rest, thank you for ensuring that our viewers get this show right on time. Well, my last words on this show shall be the words of the late Reverend Desmond Tutu, who said one time, and I quote, in whatever you do, just do right. You are a minister in Karamoja. You are an opposition party in Kenya. Your government in Kenya, wherever you are, just do right. Eventually, that right will overwhelm the world. That's it from us. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye. <laughs>